Hi, everyone. Um, I welcome you all uh, to this event organized by the Centro Latinoamericano Suizo, uh, together with the Department of Anthropology uh, of the University of Delaware uh, on imaginaries of the future in illegal markets in Latin America. I'm uh, Matias Dewey. Uh, I'm an interim professor of Latin American studies. I'm also co-directing the uh, CLS together with my colleague, uh, Thomas Grisafi. And I will, will especially like to, uh, to thank my, my colleague, Kedron Thomas, uh, who co-edited the special issue with me and came all the way to from the US to, to be with us. Um, Kedron is an associate professor of anthropology at the University of, of Delaware. And in addition to being a fine scholar, is a good friend and a good, fantastic project partner. Uh, we also thank uh, the authors who are here and those who are online, uh, to Dennis Rogers, a research professor of anthropology and sociology at the Graduate Institute Geneva, to Martin Coster, uh, who is associate professor at the Department of Anthropology and Development Studies at Radboud University in the Netherlands, to Liliana Duica Maja, who is a lecturer in the Department of Anthropology uh, at Georgian U University, and to Camilo Arturo Leslie, assistant professor of sociology at Tulane University in the United States. I would also like to thank the four undergraduate students from our university uh, who will be presenting and commenting on the author's papers today. Esme Pola Ausfeld, Felicia Charlotte Nissen, Christoph Maximilian Eisenhardt, and Giuseppe Lovagnini. Um, I would also like to, to thank my students from my course on uh, commodities in Latin America and also uh, Thomas students from your, uh, I hope you have some students <laughs> uh, from uh, subnational authoritarianism. So uh, thank you all for being here and I think Okay, thank you so much, Matias, and welcome everyone. Um, as Matias said, I'm I'm Kedrin Thomas. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'd also like to thank the University of St. Gallen and the Centro Latino America Suizo for hosting this um, this event. Uh, we're going to turn now to the themes of our special issue and talk a little bit about the research that was done for this project and some of the ideas that we hope we'll be able to discuss today. Um, here are the titles of each of the articles that appear in this collection that Matthias and I had the pleasure of editing together um, and, and bringing these terrific researchers together. We will get into the specifics of each of these research articles with our presentations from the students in a few moments. I'd like to talk a little bit about the future, uh, since that is a key concept that we discuss in the special issue. And in the introduction that Matthias and I co-authored, we start with thinking about what other social scientists have said about the future already. Uh, and of course, the future is amorphous and something that we it's difficult to get a grasp on. Um, but there are a couple of ways that social scientists have been thinking about a concept of the future. Um, one of those ways is to think about the future as something that exists uh, that is not yet, of course, being realized, but that is an outcome of the activities and the institutions that we're a part of now. So thinking about what are the activities and institutions that we're a part of leading us towards. And social scientists have tried to think about how to analyze um, how to analyze this as a, as a particular conception of the future. Social scientists have also thought about the future as something that guides actions in the present, that we imagine for ourselves what is yet to come. And then we 
engage in practices in the present that we hope will help us to achieve this. These are two very different ways of sort of researching or analyzing the future. But in the introduction to the special issue, Matthias and I try to integrate both of these to think about the ways that our actions in the present are of course strongly shaped by what we imagine will happen and our imaginings of what will happen um, in turn strongly shape what we put into practice, right? So um, both of these can be true at the same time. Um, and we're interested in this in particular in illegal market contexts. So many social science studies of the future have been done in contexts of state-sanctioned, legal, formal activities. Um, and often there's a tendency in these studies that we identified in taking a look at the existing literature to take for granted that people have similar imaginings of the future as those that are proposed by the state and by capitalist markets that we're all sort of moving progressively towards the same goals and aims. And they're the same goals and aims that a hegemonic state or a dominant market system would also have us believe in and hold out as our goals. So we were very interested in, does this look different if we're doing the research with communities that are involved in illegal economic activities and informal institutions? Do those institutions and activities give rise to different ideas about what the future could look like? Um, and actually do those activities lead to different futures? We were interested in both optimistic ideas about the future and not so optimistic ideas about the future. So pessimism, um, despair, Right, these are common sentiments that people have in many parts of the world, um, including in Latin America, when they look at what might be ahead of them. So we wanted to pay attention to challenges and risks, as well as hope and aspiration. The focus of each of the research articles is field-based qualitative research. Um, so carried out on the ground, very community focused and community driven we were able to um, pull together a set of researchers who work in diverse contexts across Latin America. So you'll hear today about research done um, in, um, in Venezuela, um, as well in Nicaragua and in urban Colombia and rural Colombia. Um, we were interested in researchers who had talked with people about their aspirations for the future and also had long-term relationships often in these field sites where they've been able to document people's practices within illegal economic sectors and to understand how those practices connect with hopes, aspirations, and also senses of despair regarding what might be ahead of them. Of course, we were looking at contexts of illegal economic activities, Matthias and I have both also done extensive research in context of illegal economic activities. So this was something we were familiar with. Um, and doing a fine grained uh, social scientific analysis, understanding that in illegal domains of economic activity, people have contested relationships to the law. They have contested relationships often to senses of social legitimacy as well, right? Are there moral, contestations around the work that people are doing? Um, are there contestations within the community uh, about the morality and acceptability of the uh, activities that people are engaged in? The framework that we lay out in the introduction, I'll just say a few words about before we turn to each of the articles. First of all, there are vast differences across illegal economic sectors in Latin America. And so one of the things that Matthias and I did was we drew on a framework that actually Matthias had developed in collaboration with other scholars, um, a model that's very useful for thinking about the different types of illegal economic activities that you encounter uh, in different parts of Latin America. Um, thinking about the degree to which an activity is considered illegal or the degree to which it's actively policed, right? Some illegal activities 
are more or less condoned, some illegal activities are actively um, policed. Uh, thinking about the moral legitimacy and acceptability of different illegal economic activities in different communities. So some illegal sectors um, like child trafficking, for instance, are sort of universally condoned within the communities where each of us has done our research. Other things like knockoff fashion and counterfeit clothing, which Matthias and I have both done a lot of work on, is considered completely acceptable by the people who are engaging in those activities. We proposed in the introduction that because the institutions that people create, that people construct in order to facilitate economic transactions are different in the legal economic sectors than in formal markets, that this would probably have some influence on both people's daily practices and on what they put their hope in, right? what they aspire to, how they imagine the future and how they expect to achieve their goals. So if you're not working with police protection over your private property, if you're not working with moral legitimacy around the economic activities that you're engaged in, then you have to create alternative institutions to help to facilitate transactions. And we were very interested in understanding these informal institutions and understanding how they shaped people's, not just economic lives, but their lives in general. And then we were also, as I mentioned before, trying to understand if illegal economic activities actually lead people to contest the hopes and aspirations that are set forth by nation states and by the formal capitalist economic sector. So we were looking at alternative visions for what the future might hold and trying to understand how people might put those visions into practice. Okay, we'll turn the discussion now over to our student discussants um, to talk about each of the papers, okay? So thank you, Kedron, for uh, this presentation. Now uh, I would like to, to, to start with the second part of this um, uh, event, which is, I mean, we, we, our intention was to do something different. And we develop a dynamic which the students present the author's papers. So um, what uh, now we are we have uh, four papers for students from my class on the sociology of illegal markets. Um, the dynamic is that they are going to present uh, the papers, and then the authors have time to respond to some questions and um, develop some or show something uh, about the field sites. So uh, I would like to ask um, uh, Christoph. Uh, I think, and Christoph will be presenting advocacy, misdirection and process and exit strategies of aspiration and anxiety. I mean, uh, Crime and conflict in Punto Mayo, and uh, Liliana is online. Yeah, this is the last one. Thank you very much. Just making sure I don't forget anything. Um, well, thank you very much for being here. Um, my topic or my article that I'm going to present to you is um, advocacy, misdirection, protest, and exit strategies um, of aspiration and anxiety amid crime and conflict in Putumayo. Um, I'll try and keep it within 10 minutes. As I've been told, that's what I'm supposed to do. 
but it is a it is a quite there's quite a lot of content in the article. Um, so first off, um, I'd like to introduce you to Putumayo. Um, it's a part of Colombia and the south uh, southwest, as you can see, bordering Ecuador and Peru. Uh, it has approximately three hundred and fifty thousand inhabitants. Um, on the second map on the left, you can see uh, the geographical and topographical map. Um, it's a border on the borderlands of uh, the Amazonas, um, and uh, therefore pretty rural and infrastructurally underdeveloped. Um, the reason why we're focusing on Putomayo is because 10% uh, of global coca production occurs in this small region of the world. Um, and it's estimated that about 25,000 hectares of uh, coca cultivation occur there. Um, first, I'm going to introduce you a little bit to, uh, well, the history of coca in Putomayo and why it has evolved to being uh, a 10% share of the global production. Um, so there's lots of things that happened between before 1974, um, but that's really when the coca started being produced or planted in Putomayo, um, because before that, most of the crops were, uh, well, were normal crops and food crops. Um, but through the election of Alfonso Lopez Mikkelsen, um, who ended various agrarian reforms and subsidy programs from the Colombian state, um, it brought the region into a crisis and made it economically unsustainable um, for a lot of people to produce uh, food crops. Um, and the Medellin cartel in 1977 then seized that opportunity uh, to introduce coca plantations and coca into um, the regional economy of Putomayo. Um, later on, the FARC, which was the or which is the revolutionary army of um, of Colombia um, increased a lot of in their presence in the region and usurped state legitimacy in many ways and authority. Uh, for example, establishing laws and growing their influence by profiting off the coca trade um, through extorting merchants and uh, in a sort of way we could say collecting taxes to draw pal in parallel to the state. Um, and throughout the 1980s, um, as the 1990s approached, the FARC uh, started expanding their influence more and more uh, around the surrounding er areas of uh, Putamayo, which uh, led to the state getting getting involved and uh, sending par or paramilitaries, which were very closely tied to the um, Colombian military, um, to stop the the growth and uh, the strength or. or the influence that FARC uh, acquired in that region. Um, and that led to a conflict in that time uh, or in the 90s um, until the early 2000s um, and ended up with control being split amongst the remaining uh, criminal paramilitary organizations and the FARC. Um, into, uh, in, the end of the two, uh, in the early 2000s, they then ended up um, splitting it equally and coming to a sort of agreement of um, of control amongst Putumayo. Um, so the government decided to go through another approach and starting fumigation efforts in Putumayo, which destroyed uh, many farmers and many people's plantations, uh, coca plantations, as well as normal food plantations. Um, and now in more recent times, uh, there was a signing of the peace agreement um, between the FARC and the uh, Colombian state, and um, which eventually failed in 2019. And uh, eventually it just led to a lot of uh, division and more um, groups taking control and less, uh, less certainty on who has authority in the region. Um, the conflict Putumayans face is a, is a difficult one because on the one hand, um, <clears throat> they need to, they see opportunity in the coca plant uh, because of its economical potential and uh, its upsides, um, helping them escape poverty, uh, potentially securing their kids a brighter future because with normal food plants, they wouldn't be able to afford um, certain levels of education for their children. Um, 
and alleviating financial pressures on others, as well as providing stability uh, because of all the few mitigation efforts. Uh, since normal crops take much longer than coca plants um, to grow, um, it provides them with a bit of protection from uh, from fumigation efforts and other uncertainties. But that opportunity is, as the article describes, very closely tied to anxiety amongst the population. Um, on the one hand, <clears throat> you of course have state pressures uh, because the state sees it as a illicit activity and doesn't want uh, that much cocoa production. Um, and you have criminal pressures because the criminals or the various gangs in the region, uh, of course, are encouraged since they're profiting off of this trade uh, to pressure you in, in ways to keep that uh, <clears throat> uh, that coca production and trade going. Um, the moral dilemma as well for people, of course, it's I don't think it's such a, as we mentioned earlier, um, producing illegal garments is one thing. Uh, producing coca is, is a is another in society, I'd say. Um, and the uncertainty, which I talked about, uh, I mean, uncertainty is a almost you, always present subject in um, in Puto Mayo's uh, well, in Puto Mayans' lives, because uh, on the one hand they have. Uh, uncertainty about fumigation efforts they have uncertainty about which gang controls their region and um they don't uh there's no clarity um the article comes to the conclusion that to deal with these anxieties um putomayans have four basic strategies of resistance uh which i'll explain to you now i'm just gonna have a quick here you go um, the first one is ideological advocacy. So, uh, Putomayans have developed a, a rough analysis of local and economics and, po and politics. Uh, I'd say I'm going to summarize it into four points. Um, the first one being that coca is good for the local co community, uh, and provides income for them to share, uh, in an economical sense. Um, the second one is that it provides stability and there is no alternatives possible because of the neglect they have faced from the state. Um, and thirdly, you have that uh, the profit from these coca plantations uh, can help start legitimate businesses and diminish reliance on coca. Um, <clears throat> the fourth being that... Uh, since the state has neglected them and for example electricity is uh, not universally present in putomaya uh, nor are sewage services or water uh, infrastructure um that they can make up for these inadequate inadequate services that the state is supposed and that the state is supposed to provide by uh, the resources and economical gain that they get from um coca plantations and the coca trade. Um, this analysis is used in three ways for themselves. In one hand, for self-affirmation um, to when bad times come to make, uh, to make sure you can get through those tough times and make sure you're thinking or that you believe that this is the right course and you're morally justifying yourself. Uh, secondly, it, it pressures the state, and uh, thirdly, it causes debates within politics uh, because some of these points are, um, well, they're they're legitimate. Uh, the second strategy is malicia or pettiness. I think it was referred to in English in the article, um, which basically says that. The Putomayan population tries to minimize their involvement with certain uh, groups and the different groups uh, in the region. So they'll compromise and uh, listen to them and provide tribute, uh, but try and stay distance from conflicts that might, might occur between uh, different groups. Um, the second thing in, uh, or the second point in Malicia is the strategic adherence to government policy, 
um, in the sense that <clears throat> glutamines will um, participate, for example, in eradication programs, uh, getting rid of one of their plantations, but generally they'll have several more. Um, and they'll take the money that they get for eradicating one plantation uh, to help sustain the others or to grow the others. And the third one is uh, purely avoidance um, by uh, moving out of uh, the region and trying to escape from this. Um, in these three ways, um, Tutamayans accept power holders while advancing their own interests always. Um, the third one is protests, uh, Putamayans protests, like we, we all do to change things in politics and change um, state policy. Uh, they use rather confrontational strategies because the FARC, uh, who also has an interest in, in passing legislation to uh, permit, have a more permissive legislation for coca trade, um, supports them in that and backs them up in their protests. Um, they also have, uh, of course, protests that are peaceful and uh, less confrontational and advocate in this way through the protests uh, for change in state policy. Um, and the fourth one is the exit strategy, um, which when all else fails, uh, Putamayans will um, move to very distant and ex inaccessible uh, regions, for example, uh, the Amazonas jungle or um, mountains and start planting uh, coca there in hopes of not being reached by the gangs and uh, states but often still be um, be affected by the fumigation efforts that the, that the state uh, launches. The second is leaving the country, um, or in the sense of going to Peru or Ecuador, which are very close, uh, and planting coca there. And um, the third one is, uh, well, leaving the life and trying to escape this by going to maybe a big city where there's... Uh, less uh, dependence on coca. Uh, the conclusion of the article is um, that Putamayans use the ambiguity, uh, ambiguity, oh my God, <laughs> ambiguity of uh, living in the Amazonian borderlands amid state and guerrilla authority to protect their engagement in the cocaine trade in four major ways, which I've just talked about. I've tried to summarize it. Um, and uh, Yes, that's that's pretty much it. I I hope I didn't um, I did your article just justice, uh, Liliana. I I very much tried my best. Uh, I'm sorry for going above time a little bit. And uh, my questions would be that you can you and your team conducted uh, 79 interviews for this article. Um, what impressions did having these interviews uh, leave on you? And did you take anything away from them till this day? Uh, I think they're unmuting you right now. So, where? Hello. Hello. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, first, uh, thank you to the University of St. Gallen and Centro Latinoamericano Suizo. Uh, also to Matias and Kedra to gather together today and all this effort in the special issue. And Christoph, I think uh, you did justice to the article. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yes, maybe I, I would like to express some ideas, maybe three main ideas just to answer. The team was uh, Professor Desmond Arias and I. We both conducted all the interviews in Putumayo, as you saw from the uh, map. Uh, Putumayo is an Andean uh, and also an Amazonian department. It has the both uh, the, the complexity is also geographical, no? So one of the uh, key things is that we conducted all the field work uh, in this honeymoon after the peace process. So we were uh, we will uh, we were able to conduct the interviews. I think that is not possible today with the situation, as you know uh, today, and maybe you just mentioned Christoph as. Uh, last year, it's the department with the the the, the that increased uh, seventy seven percent of uh, coca crops um, 
in Colombia is the the highest um is the department with with most uh, increasing uh, of cultivations in Colombia so that's one thing that why it's not possible to conduct this the same uh, research today uh, so we conducted uh, the interviews and at that time was uh, the feeling was uh, like the honeymoon after the peace process people wanted to talk about the uh, the situation uh, and coca was perceived as something as you mentioned something that <clears throat> will uh, permit to uh, to seek for these aspirations for the future for as uh, were was interesting the way, for instance, that uh, teenagers or people that uh, students that were attending university in the in the main cities as uh, Bogota, Cali, or Medellin, for instance, that they in during the um, summer break they go to work in coca crops. No, so also that says a lot about the possibilities that exist uh, uh, in the territory. Uh, and for the people that they uh, are part of the of the coca cultivations as a part to to resolve their needs, no. So that's one one of the key <clears throat> or the main takeaways that we had is that, uh, and that's the other point that I just want to to mention. It this idea that we use in social science to analyze to just divide categories: formal, informal, legal, illegal. In this case, opportunities and anxieties <clears throat> are not two different ideas, but just a system which operates and they and allows them to live their lives. No, for instance, uh, in the way that they negotiate between the state and the illegal armed groups, it's just uh, they they are not all uh, illegal or they not belong to the guerrillas or to the paramilitaries or other crime organizations, but they navigate through the uh, those different orders uh, like a state, no? Because the, the guerrillas, for instance, as, uh, as the article mentions, they regulate, for instance, environmental um, environmental punishment uh, for those for instance uh, hunting or fishing in a way that they is that, that that it's forbidden for those and they navigate all the the, the the rules and the state the state there it's a complex and hybrid uh, category because every other author author uh, every other actor uh, just enforced in their territory their own rules and the third um thing I just want to mention is that uh, referring to all these regional nuances, no, maybe in the article uh, we conducted like almost three years of uh, field research. This is the first article we are writing another one about biopolitics because also the control of the territories, control of bodies, no? And one different thing it's at the north um, in the river, in the basin of Caqueta River in the north of Putumayo, different from the Putumayo River that is at the south, that it's border, as you mentioned, with Ecuador and Peru. So the idea of this border, international border, it's also a, a, the, that creates another different way to live and to advance in the forest uh, strategies, no? For instance, uh, now uh, in Putumayo, for instance, they have a step up into the cultivation in the coca process, um, uh, they, for instance, created improvised lab laboratories of uh, sulfuric acid, that this is like a, a, a huge technology, and it's improvised. And it's uh, along the Putumayo River, and they have ships in the river. So once the uh, state um, military of Colombia goes to that uh, specific ship, they go down the river and go to another country. So uh, as uh, an attorney uh, mentioned in Colombia, in this area, the crime seems to be organized, the state not, no? So it's a complex issue. And as we have seen uh, in, in the whole uh, Amazon basin, that the crime is pretty organized uh, and it's more hybrid. Uh, and now we are seeing the expansion of those groups um, of um, uh, after fact that have been creating dissidents in neighbor countries, no, in Peru, 
Bolivia, in Ecuador, and how this is like uh, invigorating, like creating another dynamic that it's uh, interesting. The, the other thing is that Putumayo is also, it, it has this double idea of, and this Amazon, it's not, you don't have to go to the Amazon. Actually, we conducted the, 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 the interviews in the mid and uh, low Amazon, the, that the mid and low Amazon depends on the on the basin of the river and it's part of the of the Amazon basin, no? So that's one characteristic that also has that. So um regarding your, to your questions, uh, we interviewed a lot of different people. Uh, some of them were cocalero peasants today. Uh, in this area where we conducted is one of the hot spots, if we could say it like that, of conflict, San Miguel, just that, that crossing river in mid Putumayo uh, in the border with Ecuador, uh, that has been always a clashing area. Uh, we have seen that the, the, the most, um, the places where you have more violence is those uh, where you have clashing parties, specifically mid uh, Putumayo is one of that. So people were less, um, they, they, were, they, they, were, they were very like cautious to talk uh, uh, out loud, but actually we were in the middle of a, of a, of a process of cocalero protest and they would like to express what they thought. So the, the advantage we have is that at that time when we went after the peace process, they really want to talk about what uh, what was the, the, the ideas about uh, coca crops and the involvement they have actually they they advance more this protest uh, strategy while some others uh, mention as how coca is part of their daily lives no for instance uh, uh, I'm from Colombia, I'm from Bogota, actually, I still work in the Amazon in issues to land grabbing and conservation, uh, but specifically asking about coca, that it's also considered a driver of deforestation. Um, you think that this is a, an, Ill an illegal activity, so sometimes we have this idea of this, uh, as Margarita Serge that we just mentioned in the in the, in the in the presentation, in the in the article, uh, this idea of border of isolated and hot areas, hot spots, uh, but actually, uh, people that it's living there, the 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 coca is part of their daily lives. It's not because they are illegal. It's because part of the of the of the of the rural areas, specific, uh, specifically in Putumayo, they are. Uh, at, they have, for instance, the most dangerous uh, road. Uh, from the entire continent, El Trampolín de la Muerte, the trampoline of death. Simón Uribe has also um, wrote about this. Uh, so one of the things that is uh, this idea of informality, formality, legality, and in, in, in illegality was interesting how people express their own ideas about how they are involved with uh, coca crops. And they express an open um, and they are very open to talk about it. It's not a thing that we don't feel that we were like uh, investigators, but actually people is quite open and they they really want to see their names that actually we just want, we change all names, but they actually want to be seen in the, in the, in the, in the products that we uh, write, no? So they were very open to, 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 yes, to express what they want. And, at that time, you were uh, you began to see that things were changing as we uh, as we have it today. So yes, I think I can close with that. I don't know. I think I'm almost on time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th yeah thank you, Liliana, for uh, um, we have time uh, perhaps uh, at the very end uh, to to. Uh, discuss this, the, the, the papers. I would like to now uh, turn to the next uh, paper, uh, would be commented by Giuseppe Lovagnini, and the paper is Illegal Aspirations of Legitimate Crime and Illegitimate Entrepreneurship in Nicaragua. The author is Dennis Rogers, and yeah.
you prefer to come here or? Okay, he's dead. I Perfect. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank Professor Divi for the opportunity to be here and presenting uh, this uh, interesting and fascinating article written by Professor Roger Dennis with the title Illegal Aspiration of Legitimate Crime and Illegal Entrepreneurship in Nicaragua. Before getting started, a quickly overview about the presentation. First of all, I will present you the research question. Then I will give you a bit of context of where and when uh, was taken place the research. Then uh, I will point out the methodology of the paper. And then we will discuss the three main, um, three main chapters, three main uh, crime activities discussed in the paper, which is criminal activities in general, then drug dealing, market selling, and then there will be a brief conclusion and uh, three questions that uh, I selected for Professor Dennis. If I hope uh, I will not bother you. And uh, yeah. The research question is uh, what factor influence the social legitimacy of an illegal economic activity in the sense that uh, how is perceived legitimate or illegitimate uh, an economic activity which can be legal or illegal and uh, what factors influence that? This has been studied in uh, Nicaragua, in the capital, Managua, uh, more specifically in um, Barrio Luis Fano Hernandez, which is the one of the poorest uh, neighborhood in Nicaragua, in uh, Managua. Unfortunately, I didn't manage to find it on internet. I think it's really, really forgotten by God, unfortunately. And uh, the research has taken place uh, since uh, 1996 to 2020, so almost uh, two two decades of research. It's really impress impressing. About the methodology, I would like to point out that this is the thing that amazed me the most of the article because Professor Roger has managed to interview almost 70 members of the gang of this poor neighborhood. And uh, this seems, uh, I don't think it's a quite easy task. Uh, he has to gain uh, trust. And uh, it's really, really the thing that uh, amazed me the most that he has managed to do it, to let to let them open with him. Then from 1996 to the late 90s, the principal criminal activities that taking place in this neighborhood was uh, uh, all was um, uh, uh, pickpocketing, uh, armed robbering, shop uh, lifting, or uh, the usual protection business. Nothing, uh, these are uh, pretty usual uh, criminal activities and uh, they were socially tolerated but uh, not legitimated because many of the families of the, um, the gang members uh, weren't, uh, weren't supported by, these, uh, by the, the profits of these illegal activities and uh, they, they were um, medium uh, economic rewards and nothing to, um, to extraordinary. And uh, the victims of these uh, criminal activities were usually outsiders and uh, it was tolerated because it didn't bother the local community. And um, there weren't many long-term expectation about uh, these activities because many people that joined uh, uh, the gangs uh, um, were, were members until uh, almost 21. So it didn't give you any, any good perspective about the future. So it was seen as something, a short-term benefit uh, it gave, but nothing that could, uh, that could enable to live well in the long term. Then uh, in the late 90s, early 20, uh, early 2000, uh, dry, drug dealing came around and uh, 
cocaine became uh, a really, really huge uh, problem because uh, problem. It had a huge impact on the communities because there were a high rate of uh, local addictions. And uh, it's con the, in the context of which uh, came along uh, drug dealing is important because uh, there was a huge unemployment rate and uh, there weren't almost uh, any opportunities, uh, financial opportunities of doing business legally. And uh, with drug dealing came along also violence that uh, the gang imposed to, 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 to have order in the, in the neighborhood and to, to, sell the, to sell cocaine. Of course, uh, this created uh, huge profits compared to any other previous uh, criminal activities, 20 times higher than anything you could imagine if you lived there. And this uh, gave uh, a future aspirations to the to the dealers because uh, all the people involved uh, in the um, in the drug dealing had the huge uh, rewards and uh, and this uh, has gave a lot of uh, social legitima legitimacy to to drug dealing it was socially accepted accepted as a normal economic activities activity and uh, and this ensured to have a long-term benefit because many people could really have a lot of profits and that could uh, give them more, um, more, uh, more benefits in the long run. And this was see wasn't, see wasn't seen uh, as cr normal criminal activities uh, as a short-term benefit, something that could change your life. And it was seen also something of meritocratic because it gave you the opportunity to emerge. Then uh, the, the, the last activity um, explained in the paper is market selling. And this could be, uh, has been done uh, firstly uh, legal, in a legally way. So in a competitive market, uh, Professor Rogers tried to, to sell goods uh, under cutting uh, prices. So in a normal competition market, and uh, ironically, this was seen uh, as a, as a unlegitimate activity because this uh, um, managed to, to have a huge impact on the community of the other seller because uh, all the business was damaged. They fixed price uh, and, uh, and this uh, wasn't socially accepted, accepted. And there were a lot of pressure from the other community of sellers because the status quo was broken. There was a uh, all fixed price that uh, could work easily well for all the other sellers. And uh, when this equilibrium uh, has been broken, uh, brought a lot of social, uh, social uh, uh, illegitimacy. But this is a totally legal activity. Then, on the other end, when uh, there has been tried to sell uh, stolen goods, uh, which could enable to have a, a higher profit, uh, higher margin than uh, the average uh, goods sold, this wasn't seen as something bad. It was socially accepted, even it for, if, it, if it was completely illegal. And... Uh, but we have to say that this enables to have uh, a longer term benefit uh, to the seller without uh, compromising uh, the local community of seller because uh, you improve your margins uh, not uh, undercutting or uh, or uh, increasing uh, your volume by damaging other sellers on the on the other end uh, undercutting price give you a short term uh, uh, benefit because uh, the margin are still low and uh, also a huge impact on the community. Here are briefly summarized uh, what I already said that uh, gang criminality has a low impact uh, on community but um, didn't give much uh, um, much benefit on the long term short term benefits and uh, its legitimacy was uh, really really low because uh, it gave benefit only 
to the gang's member and uh, in a very, very moderate manner. Then there is uh, drug dealing, which had a huge uh, profit level, huge uh, economic reward. And uh, the impact on the community was really, really high for the high level of uh, uh, local addiction. But uh, it gave also many, many opportunities to gain wealth and on the long run. So it gave many benefits on the long run. And this was seen as a legitimate activity that could enable you to emerge from the poverty and uh, in a way meritocratic, in a meritocratic way. Then undercutting uh, prices at the local market with low low profits level was seen as a social illegitimate activity, even if it was illegal, illegal and it had a high, a high impact on the community because you damage uh, the other seller's market and uh, with a short-term benefit. Then uh, the last, uh, buying stolen goods enables you to have uh, a, a good margin, a medium uh, a medium, pro, a medium margin, but uh, without damaging the local community, you, there is also all, um, social legitimacy to the activity. There wasn't, uh, there wasn't any dissent in this regard. So uh, Professor Rogers found this correlation between uh, long-term expectatives uh, that a criminal activity or an activity in general gives uh, comparing it to his social legitimacy and uh, and uh, he has found that this is a crucial factor regarding uh, social legitimacy in general now i selected three questions for uh, professor rogers i hope uh, he is making manage to answer uh, Oh. I think we have to present the, the, the picture and if you want to. Right, yeah, I could. Have a question there. I'm just yeah. going to, uh, yeah. last one is solution to you. Okay. Right. Well, thank you very much, Giuseppe, for a great kind of a summary of um, an overview uh, of my piece. Um, and thank you for your questions. Um, I kind of slightly anticipated what you might ask, um, hence uh, preparing a few slides. Um, I'm generally asked something about how did you gain the trust of the um, of gang members? Well, these are different photos of me at different points in time over the last 25 years in Nicaragua. I mean, the one at the top is actually the first one. Um, that is me there. As you can see, I was perhaps I was quite young at the time, uh, younger than I am now, shall we say. Um, and uh, I perhaps looked a little bit like a gang member. I mean, I was occupying their social space. So it meant that um, there was kind of a very organic interaction which kind of developed. Um, the other thing is that the dynamics of the gangs at the time, although they were involved in criminal activity, revolved much more around protecting the neighborhood. It was about identity and, and so on. So in some ways, well, to cut a long story short, I got integrated into the gang. Um, and it was partly because having a foreign gang member made the gang, the local gang stand out um, compared to other gangs. So it was a kind of status thing in that sense. But it did mean, um, it did mean that uh, I then got access. Gang members trusted me. Uh, they talked to me about their things. I was able to observe things that they did, um, both illegal and legal things, uh, because it should be said that you know, the vast majority of activities of gang members are legal. Um, they they kind of are youth gang members. They kind of they dance, they drink, they kind of flirt, they kind of have friendships, they do all the usual things that you, young people do, uh, as well as kind of be gang members. 
I one thing and thinking about the theme of the uh, special issue, this idea of futurity. I mean, one of the things which has been quite interesting in terms of my research is that because it's a long-term research, a longitudinal research, my status has evolved. Um, so obviously there it was very easy to kind of uh, hang out with gang members. Um, but later it became a bit more complicated. You know, I'm not quite looking the same kind of buff way. Um, and as you can see here, I mean, it's uh, I'm actually hanging out quite a lot more with older gang members because the, the look of being a kind of middle-aged man sitting on a street corner with young children or oh, young youth is not a very good look, shall we say. Um, but the thing is that over time, of course, I'm a respected elder. So the youth do trust me. It's almost become a rite of passage for gang members in the neighborhood to actually do an interview with me. Uh, they're not a proper gang member unless they've been interviewed by Dennis. Um, but I think it's... Um, uh, so that's kind of what was, I kind of answer about how did I get approached them. Your second question was about um, danger, and I mean, yes, you do occasionally get kind of put in danger. But I think it's um, uh, I think it's you would also if you weren't researching gangs in that kind of neighborhood. Um, I think I've also been, you know, I, I don't believe in this kind of hard man trope of ethnography. I think it's a very unhealthy one. Um, I actually ended up studying gangs by accident. Uh, mainly kind of my interaction with them was a self-defense mechanism. I first, when I first arrived in Nicaragua, within three days, I was attacked and beaten up by a gang. And it became a kind of protection mechanism to actually engage and interact with the gang and develop a relationship with them. Um, and then after that, I have to admit, I didn't necessarily think through uh, all, all sorts of things. So sometimes you get, you fall into situations. Let's just say there's, there's a God for stupid anthropologists. Um, but you, but you're just kind of muddling your way through. The bigger issues are more things like seeing illegal things. Um, you know, I've been very careful to try and say, you know, I'm not going to go. If I see somebody mugging somebody, I will report that. Um, so yeah. On the other hand, if I see somebody with drugs, I'm not going to report that. I mean, it's a, as paper tries to outline, it's a, it's a fundamental form of, uh, of income for many families there. And it's one of the few ways they, they can survive. Um, but I have actually tried, been very careful not to go out with, uh, with gangs when they go out and attack other neighborhoods, for example. Um, I put a limit to where, what I do and where I go, but inevitably sometimes you don't, you can't predict things, and actually, over time, that's one of the well, that's one of the biggest difficulties of doing longitudinal research. You start thinking you know things very well, so you become a little bit too omniscient, and perhaps sometimes you get too confident. And occasionally, things happen which make me kind of um, uh, remind me that I'm I'm a stranger in this context, and I there's always going to be unpredictability. On your last question, um, which is about solutions to view legal activities as socially, uh, how, how do we kind of, how do we socially legitimize activities which might be on the edge of legality, for example? Um, I think one of the things which um, thinking, when I reread the piece today uh, on the train ride up, um, one of the things that struck me actually, and which I didn't develop in the piece, is the fact the way that legitimacy it's also very, it's not just linked about this notion of the future, but it actually gets linked to the level of wealth. Um, I mean, there's a reason why drug dealing uh, became seen as socially legitimate. It's because it generated so much wealth that it was, um, uh, that it, it was, people just couldn't afford to not legitimize it. Um, I think one of the big problems for a lot of activities, particularly vending uh, uh, in the market, is the profit margins are so low. And, you know, when you're, so I think if you want to kind of uh, avoid kind of problems of kind of fixing of prices or trying to kind of maintain um, uh, systems of sales and so on to allow more flexibility, you probably have to make sure that the values um, of things that are being sold is higher. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, as I said, the profit margins of these stalls at the time was incredibly low. It was about, you know, $75 uh, a month. Um, 
And this is for working from five o'clock in the morning to six o'clock at night, basically nonstop. Um, and so you're having very, very kind of uh, low levels of profit. So I think increasing profits is one of the ways to actually legitimize it. But um, thank you very much for your comments and your questions. Thank you, Dennis. Um, and now we have the next paper, which is uh, hope amid, amid crisis, normative ambiguity, and uh, the middle class and investment fraud in 2000s Venezuela. And I, the, the, Good. Thank you, Esme, for uh, presenting the paper. And the other side is uh, Camilo. Hi, Camilo. Somewhere. Yes. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Disembodied voice. A, a, a bit of delay, but I, I think it, the conversation will be okay. Hopefully. Yeah. Good. Hello, um, today I'm going to present you the article about hope and a crisis, normative ambiguity in the middle class and investment fraud in the 2000s Venezuela by um, Leslie. And I'm going to start with the introduction, which just gives a quick overview. And I will continue with the timeline for some context. And then I'm going to talk more about the middle class Venezuelans and the Stanford Financial Group. And then I'm going to elaborate on why the fraud in Venezuela was a gray area. And we're going to finish off with my questions. So for the introduction, um, Stanford Financial Group's investment scheme in Venezuela was between 1986 and 2009. They were selling certificates of deposits. Um, in the late 1980s, Stanford Financial Group launched a stock brokerage and... Um, oh, should I... Wait. <laughs> um, they launched a stock brokerage and commercial bank to sell um, certificates of deposits, which were dollar denominated and set globally diversified. However, um, there were no new deposits. Um, they used the new deposits to repay old investors. So the whole thing was actually a Ponzi scheme. And middle class Venezuelans were mostly affected by the scheme because they were insecure and sus susceptible to fraud. And this goes in hand with the onset of the normative ambiguity in the late um, 1970s and early 2000s. And normative ambiguity is um, a lack of clarity regarding what is morally right and wrong. Um, there were conflicting beliefs and ill-mannered Ill behaviors of others. Um, are interpreted as a calculated, like as a sign of calculated disrespect in my case between middle class Venezuelans and the government in Venezuela. And this is also a quote from the text, which I find really interesting. Um, Futurity and fraud, she, that's a quote from Brooke Harrington, um, um, are con conjoined epistemic phen phenomena, each 
predicated on gaps in knowledge. Um, yeah, it's just such an epistemic problem, specifically a loss of legal and moral clarity that is that the study explores through the lens of normative ambiguity. And now the timeline um, for context. So in 1958, the Punto Fijo Pact, that was an agreement for a new democratic system, out the general Marcos Peretz, which who was an um, AD populist that was the um, Association Democratica, and a new two-party system was established, um, which was with the AD, so the Social Democratica and the Christian Democratic Party COPE. And then in the 1970s, there was a surge in oil prices, which led to abundance, um, especially for middle-class Venezuelans who um, had newfound abundance and affluence. They were traveling to Miami at the time um, and they kind of believed that they were immune to the economic economical issues that um, were plaguing South American countries at the time. And the period of abundance ended with the Viernes Negro, which in English, of course, means Black Friday. Um, this was um, the because of the devaluation of the Bolivar. So the Venezuelan currency was not as secure as previously thought. And there was an, an economic downturn and double digit inflation. There was also mutual distrust between um, economic actors and the middle class Venezuelans saw the government as unreliable and um, untrustworthy. And the austerity measures and li liber liberalization measures, measures announced by um, Perez Carlos um, Andres Perez and led to widespread widespread protest, looting, violence. And this um, ended with the Caracazzo, um, which ultimately ultimately ended the legitimacy of the Punto Fijo Pact. And in 1994, there was also the collapse of the major Venezuelan bank, um, which exposed the middle-class Venezuelans to financial risk. Um, therefore, future, futurity was afloat and middle-class Venezuelans were planning against the state. And there was a huge division between the state and middle-class Venezuelans. So... Now, um, how the division between the middle class Venezuelans um, and the state actually should be in the title, sorry, um, led to vulnerability. Um, so the projectivity um, of the Venezuelans um, was their act of considering possible futures and um, possible means of achieving that, them. Um, and they all had similar financial goals. Um, they had all had finite working careers and were trying to secure a future. And the hostile environment in Venezuela um, because of the inflation and devaluation of the Bolivar, um, yeah, they had to find a new approach um, to financial for their financial planning, right? And um, yeah, this was their response to the challenge um, posed by this very high instability in Venezuela at the time. And uh, the state's um, institution also became increasingly unreliable. And 
um, which also influenced the financial decisions of Venezuelans. And there were also high level of violent crimes. And so therefore the Venezuelans tried to seek rescue um, in US dollar dominated um, assets. And Stanford Financial Group um, presented kind of a solution for those Venezuelans affected, and they used an emotional and practical um, aspects in the scheme that they um, did. So on one hand, um, the emotional side, um, where they were um, they enticed Venezuelans by offering them a vision of a more secure future. Um, and positioned as a beacon of hope in, in a time of a very high vulnerability of the Venezuelan people. And they also offered them a unique customer experience. And especially when operating in cities with traffic and crime problems, and they had luxurious offices and superior customer service. Um, and on the practical side, they offered a... Um, dollar dominated asset with high yield and allowed um, clients to escape the, the Bolivar um, and allowed them to accu accumulate wealth in US dollars. And they also protected customers um, with like sending couriers for them. So they don't have to deal with like the high tra um, traffic and crime um, when they would have left their house with like important bank documents. Um, so the Stanford Financial Group, um, yeah, made their life easier. And as well with the online portal, they were not exposed to the risks, which um, they would have been if they would have had to go out, right? And... So why is it the gray area of fraud in Venezuela? It's because it's not a straightforward um, example of an illegal market. The Stanford Financial Group was operating in a gray area and they were also not the only bank doing so. For example, Credit Suisse um, was there as well. And um, so the Stanford Financial Group was a fraudulent firm operating, of course, in a normalized sector of the economy. And yeah, the legal and moral clarity also declined over time. And I have four questions, but like maybe I can tell my two favorite questions um, because maybe we don't have time um, for all of them. So definitely um, fut futurity and fraud um, both share a reliance on knowledge gaps. This was in my quote as well earlier. Um, and then my question is, um, or in the quote of the text, of course, which I showed earlier. Um, and my question is, is legality solely appreciated when there is a sense of future security or um, does a lack of futurity lead to an increased illegality? Camila, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the presentation. So thanks very yeah, much to uh, uh, Matias Kedrin, the uh, Center for Latin American Studies, University of St. Gallen, and for Esme for her very able summary of my paper. Thank you all. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about the larger project. Um, this is a study I conducted in 2010 and 2011. It was actually a two-sided study. Part of it was what this paper was based on. It was in Caracas, Merida, and Valencia in Venezuela. And the other half was in um, some cities in the southern United States. So this, uh, in the monograph, it's going to wind up being a comparison of the two largest pools of investors in this fraud, which were Venezuelans and people in the United States. So I did corresponding uh, research in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Houston, Texas, and Miami, Florida. So roughly same amount of um, interviewees on each side. And there's also a corresponding um, set of interviews that I conducted with ex-employees of the firm who were tasked with selling these fraudulent certificates of deposit. 
Um, as as Matt mentioned, it was you know roughly a seven billion dollar fraud, about five and a half if you take away fictitious interest. Um, so really large fraud, second only to the the Bernie Madoff scam um, in terms of scale, at least in the U.S. context. Um, so I want to you know I'll keep my my comments relatively short today. I set the paper up as um, kind of a reflection on futurity and legality as specifically a kind of epistemic problem. Um, and um, I want to note something that differentiates this paper, it makes it a little bit of an oddball within the larger corpus of papers. Um, this was not uh, an illegal sector of the economy as such. Certainly Stanford was a fraudulent firm, but they were operating within a, a normal legal sector of the economy. Offshore investing is perfectly legal, maybe contraindicated, but legal. But what um, made me feel that the, the broader framework of the special issue was really generative for me was the ability to think about what happens when our institutional scaffolds specifically gov governmental scaffolds that um, we depend on explicitly or implicitly to uh, undergird our sense of futurity, our ability to plan for the future, our hopes and so forth, when they slowly come into uh, disrepute and they fall into disrepair. And that's what I try to trace in that uh, first section of the paper that goes from the 1970s to 2000s. Basically, how did people's... Um, at least the middle class sectors, pretty deep sense of trust in and even pride in uh, Venezuelan institutions slowly erode to the point where by the 2000s, they felt they had to guard themselves against the state, find other workarounds and find other scaffolds for their uh, futures, for their, for their plans and their hopes. Um, and that's where Stanford comes in. So Stanford, a, a firm operating within a licit sector of the economy, but within a context in which broader institutional, which is to say governmental scaffolds had crumbled in the 30 year period preceding, um, was able to pull off this scam very successfully in that context. So the idea being, if you live in a sector or in a, in a society where um, the governmental scaffold of your futurity and planning fall into disrepair, that might actually um, vulnerabilize you to fraudulent activities. So it's a little bit of an inversion of maybe the, the setup that um, obtains in some of the other papers. Okay, so uh, a little bit about the field work. Um, again, three cities in each country is roughly uh, 100 and something interviewees total. Uh, in addition to this, I draw on corporate documents, a ton of court documents from the US, Antigua and Barbuda, Venezuela, Canada. Uh, regulatory documents, securities and exchange issue documents that have gotten through Freedom of Information Act requests and so forth. Um, I want to say, I want returning to the, the kind of epistemic thing. So um, you always, when you write something, you go back and you rethink it. And, and I think that this intersection that was essentially the prompt for the special issue of think through how legality and futurity or illegality and futurity relate was already a pretty heady theoretical brew. Um, and I, I don't regret not complicating it in real time, but looking back now, and even today, listening to some of the commentaries on the first two papers and the author's responses, the frequency with which questions of legitimacy, respect, and so forth come up, makes me realize that um, an under-elaborated theme in my own paper is the degree to which Futurity is not just an epistemic question, but really a moral and affective one. And that that's something that I, I would like to, um, I think, uh, work more on in the future. So when people feel that they are being one way or another, whether by their governing institutions, private institutions, what have you, disrespected in the present, that also signals something to them about those institutions esteem, not just for their present self, but for their accumulated selves, which is to say their past. So there's a sense in which by flattering somebody, by seeming to honor them in the present, you are also providing a kind of psychic integrative function for them, which signals to them that these people not only respect whatever I appear to be in the present, 
but my present, my accumulated work history, my status, um, my just general trajectory in life. And that also then provides a kind of moral and effective ground from which they can project a future self and in which they can ground plans, hopes, and so forth. And I think Stanford really um, perfectly uh, exploited this, this question. So it didn't just give people um, tools, dollarization of their lives, uh, access to easy currency exchange, black market currency exchange, and so forth, that made them, um, that gave them the kind of practical tools for planning future activity, retirement, um, buying their children a house, what have you. Um, but also there's th this question of the status flattery that the firm was able to affect vis-a-vis -vis its Venezuelan clients was not just epistemic, but very much a moral thing and helped shore up or helped mitigate, I think, some of the moral injury that those same middle-class Venezuelans had felt over a long period of time vis-a-vis -vis their government, whose um, uh, discourse, especially post-2003-2004 under Chavismo, had become quite hostile to middle-class Venezuelans. So they were feeling unmoored from the polity and uh, very unsure, not just practically, but um, you know, psychically and morally about their social standing. Along comes a firm that says, oh, we'll take you in, we'll flatter you. Of course, you're a successful person. Um, this is a fancy elitist firm, but we're happy to have you, right? All these things were very powerful um, supports for people's ideation and ability to project into the future. So um, one other thing that uh, occurs to me that's interesting here that is under elaborated in the paper is the extent to which both my US and Venezuelan interviewees uh, largely hailed from the oil sector. So um, ex-employees of PDVSA, Petróleos de Venezuela, the main uh, state petro firm in, in uh, Venezuela, and then ExxonMobil mostly in the U.S., and maybe the degree to which um, private sector supports of futurity. People grow up with these firms over decades, and then they retire, and they're completely um, acclimated to the idea of private supports for future planning. Along comes a firm offering them a kind of bridge to the future and that that also i think worked worked well in tandem but uh, that's all i've got thank you all um i really appreciated your commentary esma and this has been fun thank you uh, camilo i think i always thought that your paper it's bringing into the discussion uh, a topic which is not the main topic of the the main the, the special issue but I think it's so important in Latin American context. This is the the, cri the idea of crisis, yeah. Uh, crisis and illegal markets probably Kedron, We should think about another special issue: <laughs> crisis and illegal markets. So, um, uh, and the fourth uh, paper, uh, which is illegal housing in Medellin, auto construction and the materiality of hope. Uh, Three authors, Martin Koster is 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 here, um, and would be presented by Felicia Charlotte Nissen. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Uh, as I said, I'm Felicia, and um, I have the honor of presenting to you Martin Koster's work today, who we have here, which is a big pleasure, and. Just gonna wait a bit. <laughs> yes. Okay, so my topic was illegal housing in Medellin, auto construction and the materiality of hope.
it, how do I do it? Yeah, do I have a mouse? Oh, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Okay, so my conscience. Um, at first, I'm going to try and explain the housing deficiency in Medellin. And then I'm going to try and conceptualize the auto-construction as a material practice of hoping, while then um, explaining the struggle for Vivenda Digna. Um, and then I'm going to try and analyze how the roots of hope are connected to the past and how this is a problem in the future and in the present. And um, then I'm going to introduce to you our ACES, um, as well as trying to explore the role of the state ambiguity. And then I have my questions for you. So the housing deficiency in Medellin. Um, Medellin is well situated in a basin of a valley, meaning that um, the urbanizing, urbanizable land is very limited, which insanely drives up housing prices and land prices, which then leads to a deficit of 32,733 households as of the time of the paper. And if we then look at the new constructions in the real estate market at the same time period, we can see that 95% of the new constructions are assigned to commercial, yeah, to the commercial market. Um, and only 5% is assigned to social housing, which then obviously has a big consequence for the lowest income households who are then forced to break the law by um, squatting or purchasing land uh, to build a house of their own using their own limited resources. And this they do without legal permission. And an example of this would be El Oasis, which is um, yeah in Moravia um, and it used to be a garbage dump. And um, people actually in 2015 then started auto constructing some houses there. But because this was against the law, this led to evictions of the residents as well as demolitions of the houses and the residents had to pay fines. So now I'm gonna try and conceptualize auto construction as a material practice of hope. So at first we need to define hope. Um, hope is defined as the expectation of a better future, especially for those who live in uncertain conditions. And yes, I'd say hope is rather an, an internal resource but then again, we also take actions for hope to work towards a yeah, different future. So hope can also be an act. Then auto-construction auto um, is the process that enables low-income urban residents to build their own houses according to their own needs, preferences, and available resources. And this is thereby an expression of hope for the future. So houses in general can thereby be defined as concrete embodiments and imaginary representations of people's relations to their conditions of existence. And all of this then leads to the definition of a self built house as a symbolic vehicle of transformation towards different circumstances. Um, yeah, as people really invest in their future and see their self like progressing and hoping in the future. So now I'm going to try and explain the struggle for Vivenda Digna. And um, this is actually the right to dignified housing that is stated in the Colombian constitution. And this exact expression is used by state officials as well as by the lowest income households. By state officials is used to describe the legal right to dignified housing. And by the lowest income households is actually kind of used to legitimize the action of auto-construction, which I'm going to explain further in a second. Um, so the auto-constructors actually hope for being granted a dignified living situation, as this is supposed to be their legal right. Um, this then kind of shifts legitimacy, uh, legitimacy um, as auto-construction is an illegal practice, as I said already, um, but it's attempting to fulfill their own right to a legal product, which is the dignified housing. And they actually purposely use the same language, which I would uh, yeah, see as an expression of a desperate attempt to improve the communication and the relationship between auto constructors and the government, because they try to yeah, connect through the use of language. So in total, I would say you could see the struggle for Vivenda Digna also as a struggle for permanence and for being able to stay somewhere and build the future there. Yes, okay, so now I'm going to explore the roots of hope, and um, these lie in the past, 
not very long ago, but still the past. Um, so in the mid 2000s, Medellin was declared as a pioneer of social urbanism after before having the highest homicide rates in the world. Um, and yeah, this was the Medellin miracle because nobody thought it would be possible. <laughs> And um, they actually then hosted the seventh United Nation Habitat World Urban Forum with equity as the center of the forum. And that was in 2014, which is uh, important for later. And um, they were also granted prestigious awards. Um, for example, that the local gov government was recognized for how they dis distributed the benefits uh, of the urban development and innovation evenly across the socioeconomic spectrum. So key takeaway, the past was very good for the lowest income class. And that's why they think they should hope. But then we come to the future. So the government and the state gained a lot of confidence from this um, Medellin miracle. And they now actually want to shift yeah, towards a different economic sector because they want to shift from light manufacturing to the service sector. And this obviously needs um, a shift in an economic strategy. And this new economic strategy is facilitated by the attraction of international capital. So international capital meaning human capital, so very educated workers, as well as yeah, international capital investment. So obviously need, they need a lot of new infrastructure as well as they need to green city spaces to make it more attractive for educated workers to live there. And then they need to build a lot more middle and upper class housing. Um, and they are trying to establish favorable economic conditions for multinational companies, like for example, tax breaks or favorable and flexible um, employment conditions for them. So, this shift in economic strategy also shifts the socio-economic focus kind of, because as you might have been able to tell, it shifts from the lower income class, which was focused on equity before as the roots of hope, to the middle and upper class of income. Um, yeah, as they're now trying to really facilitate their services uh, yeah, economy. And uh, also one could say that this shift in economic strategy is at the cost of the lowest income class because they are the only ones suffering under this shift. So now I'm gonna introduce to you El Oasis um, and it's situated in Moravia. And as I said, it used to be a garbage dump. Um, and then in 2015, uh, some residents started auto constructing the houses there. And um, Actually, they improved their houses gradually because they started off with kombuchas, which was kind of like a self-made shelter just to have a roof atop, a roof above your head. And um, they then tried to modify them into ranches, which were built out of wood to then finally yeah, have a castle, which was a house made of bricks. And um, yeah, this progress, you can really see they try to improve their living conditions, which also shows that they really tried to take control of their life, that they were very proud of it, that they were very focused on their personal progress. Um, and they were actually hoping to um, have these kind of houses uh, formalized because they were hoping they were gonna get access to public services, which they would then pay taxes for, so water and electricity. Um, and this is called gridding, for uh, yeah, gridding. And um, it actually means that the lowest income class becomes visible to the government by paying taxes, therefore being included in the state. And um, in May 2017, um, they got, yeah, they had a big meeting with the council of the city and the uh, public service provider, and then some residents of El Oasis. And um, they got promised access to these public services and therefore also to being able to pay taxes, which then obviously spiked their hopes of um, only temporarily being illegal and then being formalized and legitimized. And yes, uh, so then some residents actually recall seeing some yeah, public service workers um, looking at their electricity posts. And so they were really happy about this. Um, but then in August 2017, there was a fire due to a short circuit on an electricity post and 349 families lost their homes. And actually 
the first fire engine to arrive had empty water tanks while the second one had a broken hose. So yes, the fire could not be stopped that easily. Um, the government then offered subsidies to uh, these residents as they were yeah, victims of a natural disaster. Um, but they established such high bureaucratical barriers that most of the residents were not able to claim any subsidies um, because, okay, to be classified as an owner, they had to have any kind of owning certificates. These could either, if they actually purchased the land, could have been burned in the house, or as I said, some people also just squatted the land, meaning just took it, um, making them a possessor. So either if the documentation was lost, they were going to be a possessor because there was no proof, or they didn't buy it, but squatted it. So they were going to be a possessor anyways. But actually being a possessor is defined by possessing something. So when the house then burned, they had no possession, meaning they were then reclassified as occupants, meaning they had no yeah, no right to claim any subsidies or any social housing or any help in any kind of way. And also you can kind of hear occupant is very negatively yeah, connotated, I'd say, really emphasizing the illegality that the government achieved by these bureaucratic barriers and reclassifying the residents. Um, then, as you can see here, uh, the government actually claimed the land to... Uh, have an ecological garden and also they have future plans for having yeah ecological residents there which is yeah soon to take place maybe so yeah okay so now i'm going to try and summarize the role of the state and how it's ambiguous um so we have a few legal contradictions so at first we have the colombian national police code which says that auto construction is a violation of the local urban planning norms and regulations um meaning that police can violent, not violently, but they do it, um, can evict the residents from their homes. And that stands in strong contradiction with the Colombian constitution, which says that everyone should have a right to dignified housing. Um, so that's the first legal contradiction. And then also, as I just explained, um, the compensation uh, stands in strong contrast to the bureaucratical barriers that the government is trying to establish by reclassifying the residents. Um, then we also have an emotional paradox to it because um, actually the residents by formalization and gridding, that's like their desperate attempt to pay taxes to be part of the state, to be included and to be perceived as legal. Because as I said, they don't want the illegality to be consistent. They just want it to be uh, temporary. Um, so on the one hand, we have the residents really wanting to pay taxes, but then we have the state actually yeah, giving tax breaks to multinational companies um, to attract them, which I find a bit hypocritical maybe. Um, and we have another difference in the income classes. For example, there's loads of construction without permission or necessary documentation in the real estate market. And that's actually punished less than auto construction. And um, also a big hip hypocrisy, I think, is um, that there are tours for international visitors through the auto-constructed parts um, that are being celebrated because of the residents' historical achievements of constructing the homes against all odds. Um, while actually the state is kind of glorifying their own protagonism in this because they're emphasizing on how the government was doing the final crucial work of turning the places around. And yes, so... Summarizing this, I'd say the state can either act as a um, hope generation machine, but it's also destroying hopes at the same time. And I think the aspect of present and past or future uh, is very important to that. So yeah, thank you for listening. And now I have a few questions. I hope I did your work just, but yeah. So should I maybe focus on two questions or... Okay, because I think the first one, would you define auto construction as legitimate? I find quite interesting. And then the third one as well, but yeah. I just learned about all the questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Oh yeah, I, I, I like a last minute, um, Thing I did was I I I I looked for some pictures, but actually your pictures were much uh, much nicer. 
um, you even found one of the fire. So I, I, I couldn't find it on my computer. Adam has a lot of those. He, it's a pity that Adam Moore is not here. He did, um, uh, the field work for this, um, uh, uh, research. Um, and together with, uh, Flavio Aero, we wrote this article. Um, in the meantime, I was doing most of my field work in Brazil in Recife in the Northeast of Brazil. And um, Adam and Flavio and I, we kept on comparing the two cities. Both research projects were very much about uh, urban development and, and the way uh, urban activists and, uh, and community leaders were um, uh, uh, yeah, negotiating these different interventions with the state and, and, and trying to improve the situation in, in their neighborhood. Um, so this, this is Adam actually in the center with the striped uh, shirt. This is in, uh, in Moravia. Um, let me see. There's this. This is also a picture of Moravia, but like I said, your pictures were actually much better. Um, and and this is uh, the the garbage dump. Um, and you you had this picture from 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 uh, like an aerial picture. Um, and here you can also see these. Um, um, how do you call that? Like, how would you call it in English? Like cots, charts, charts. Sorry, panels. Thanks, panels. Uh, panels explaining the history of uh, the neighborhood and also celebrating um, uh, entrepreneurialism. I mean, this is a big thing, especially in Medellin. Um, so explaining or actually um, seeing these uh, first residents who came there and built their own houses as entrepreneurs. They were they are celebrating their entrepreneurial spirit because they, they really could... Um, uh, uh, start a life uh, in Medellin, uh, sh yeah, showing that they were they're, they're good residents of Medellin because they were able to to, to build their own houses. Uh, and now, as you can see, it's a community or a communal garden. So they kind of covered the garbage dump with concrete, and there's a, a top layer of some soil, and they planted all kinds of uh, beautiful plants and trees there. Um, so. Um, yeah, about let me go back to your questions. If I go back like this, will I find them? No. Sorry about that. Oh, maybe I just close this one. Oh, sorry about that. Um, as legitimate, yeah. What? Well, for uh, uh, looking at it from the perspective of the residents, uh, yes, definitely. Uh, I mean, um, I, I remember when Kidron and Matthias uh, in, invited us for uh, to join the special issue, for which I'm still very grateful. Uh, Adam and Flavio and I, we had some discussions about it, like, okay, well, what, what shall we do with this concept of illegality? Um, because actually for the residents, illegality was not, it's not an, an amic concept. It's not something they... They, they talk about or they, they I mean, I, I can't say that they don't care about it because they know very well that they build illegal houses. Uh, um, and of course, uh, they, they, they know that it means it may mean that they will be evicted at some moment in the future. Um, but but for them, it is legitimate. It's 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 the way you try to secure a place in the city for for many of them. Uh, if If you uh, don't want to uh, be a tenant and and pay rent and like like in the article we show how people talk about it and they say well uh, 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 many of them have rented rooms or a house in the past and they say that that's awful I mean you pay rent and you know for for what use it's kind of money that you lose uh, and you and you can be kicked out by your landlord so um, auto construction is much better and it's actually part of what people tend to see as this vivienda digna, that you have your own, um, you have a sense of agency and a sense of um, possibilities, you know, and, and, and improving your house for the future. Um, so the second question, the movement from manufacturing to service is generally a desired economic goal. How do you think this could be done without hurting lowest income class? Whoa, yeah, that is a big question. Um, sorry? It's a Yeah, yeah, it, it is a very good question. I mean, um, I mean, the the people who live in these low income neighborhoods, they they are they they don't have most of them them don't have jobs in any sector at all. 
um, so, um, but now what they're doing in Medellin or what they have been doing in the, for the last uh, decade is, you know, uh, this service sector is also very much focused on uh, digital services on, 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 uh, yeah, all kinds of, uh, uh, international businesses that are involved in that. Um, I think, I think it's, it's a difficult one for me to answer. Um, um, yeah, it's, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I find it a difficult one because, because it's, it's, this sector is so remote from what people in the low income neighborhoods do and what they want to do or what they, you know, of course they could, some of them will find work in these new high rises with uh, all kinds of offices as, as at the reception desk or in security or as security guards or, or as janitors or cleaners, of course, but um, I don't think they will be, they will, they will be part of, of, of this, this new industry soon ish. Um, so let me have a look at the third one that slightly says the first could have been related to state actions. Uh, yes. I mean, rumors had it that the fire was the, the, the result or the consequence of a human deed. Um, so the official story was that there was a short circuit, um, which makes sense and it's easy to believe because, you know, when you look at all the wires coming together in these, um, in these, these, these boxes, then, you know, yeah, <laughs> there, there might be a problem at some moment. Um, but, but many people in the neighborhood said, yeah, I mean, this is, this, this, this has been done on purpose, especially because we were so close to being, or possibly be uh, taking a next step in legalizing the neighborhood by having these uh, electricity meters installed, which would indeed mean that people had to pay taxes because they had an official legal electricity connection. And once you pay taxes, you can move from this occupant status to being a, 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 a possessor, a poseedor, uh, which means that you have more rights. And in case of eviction, you could get more, um, uh, uh, like uh, compensation, right? So, yeah, many of the people, because what, what Adam did, he was there before the fire in El Oasis, and then he came back after the fire, and he traced many of the residents who went to live in other parts of the city. And Flavio went with him for about a month or so, I, I could only be there for 10 days. So that's why I'm saying it's really a pity that Adam cannot join us today. We were going back, uh, but then the pandemic started. So we couldn't, we couldn't co come, uh, go back to, to Medellin for a follow-up. Um, but um, well, I'll go there next year uh, to, to, to follow up this project uh, myself. But he, um, he also made a video, you can find it online, a video with uh, about the fire. It's, it's specifically about the fire and you can uh, see the different fragments of interviews that he conducted with um uh residents uh all about the fire and this idea of uh looking for vivienda digna and 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 also reflecting on what they call andar rodando which is like the, the living the life they they don't want which means like um yeah andar rodando is like being swept from one side to the other uh like tumbleweed in a way you know so they they but they're looking for for stability to be able to 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 secure their future in the city. Yeah, thank you very much. And I forgot to thank you. I mean, I started answering the questions with Matthias and Kidron. It was wonderful. And thank you very much for your kind invitation. Well, I'm so impressed um, with each of the presentations. Thank you so much to the students who um, volunteered to do this work. I assume they volunteered. I, I actually don't know, uh, but thank you. Kind of, right. <laughs> There's something under the table happening. Um, so thank you so much. And thank you to each of our authors. We do have some time left for questions. So I'd like to open it up now. Um, for questions from anyone in the audience. If you're joining us on Zoom and you have questions, perhaps you could enter them in the chat. Okay, terrific. Okay.
Thank you. Uh, I just like to second that. I thought the student presentations were excellent. So thank you. Um, question for Martin. Um, so your whole framing that people were squatting this land as an idea of hope. But one of the things that I've certainly observed in Bolivia is that mafias tend to control squatting because as soon as the land gets legalized, you know, within five years, it goes up massively in, uh, uh, in, in value. Thank you. So, yes, yeah, so I just wanted to ask about that is like, is is it a straightforward narrative of hope that you're telling or are there also sort of local strongmen, mafias getting involved and also controlling this sort of scenario? Links to my course. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, the as they call them, the muchachos are, are very much present in these neighborhoods. Um, they play a big role in... in, in um, what people can and can't do also with regard to uh, finding a plot to build a house, for example, or, uh, uh, well, basically everything. Um, for, for, for safety reasons, Adam did not do a lot of research on uh, what these muchachos actually do. I mean, but they were there all the time. Um, and, and, and it's, it's, I think it's somewhere in a note that we said we, um, in the note in the article, um, we explain a little bit more about it. That um, it was usually when 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 uh, urban development projects started. So when when there were like interventions, uh, for example, parts of the neighborhood had to be uh, evicted and removed. People had to be be removed, and there were new buildings. Uh, they were going to build new buildings. Um, then uh, uh, those who resisted would be visited by one of the the muchachos, one of the boys, usually with um, you know motor helmets on, so you couldn't really see who they were. Um, so there was a, a clear link. There is a clear link between those. Uh, oh, and I forgot to say, but the muchachos are like paramilitaries who are in in charge of the drug trade as well. Um, so there's a clear link between urban development and the corporate well yeah the, the 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 corporations and companies involved in that and and the paramilitaries obviously um but it's all you know obviously it's very shady and sometimes hard to 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 analyze and like i said for safety reasons we didn't really want to go into that um maybe not maybe not so much for safety reason but more for reasons of being able to continue the research project I think, yeah, yeah. We need Dennis to go in and um, uh, get in, uh, build trust with the muchachos. Yeah. Okay, other other questions? Any of our students um, who are here as audience members have questions for the authors? Is there a question from um, one of our presenters that did not get asked during your presentation that you'd like to, to ask now? Hey, Tom, you have another? No? You might, you might want to ask it right now. No, I think she answered. Okay. I have a question. I think a discussion that I have, I like to to have with my some of my students here and 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 the courses is it's about the role of politics and and the relation to this type of economies. And 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 an interesting thing is they might be not just very much interested in in enforcing regulations, but doing quite the opposite in non-enforcing regulations because something good. Let's put in in this economic term is positive externalities might be the result of these economies. So I wanted to to ask you, especially to you, Dennis, about this. The the, you, the the role of politics it doesn't appear very much in this in this story. And I wanted to know how what is the the image of the state in in this in this uh, in your case. And 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 how the role of of politics in in general. I mean, part of the reason the state doesn't emerge in this particular article is because it is very much a, a bottom up 
thing, but actually one of the things which has characterized Nicaragua is actually the drugs trade in Nicaragua has effectively been nationalized by the state. Um, and so in that sense, there is a, it is now immensely political. Um, and so the, you know, the, I think when you have illegal activities which generate significant amount of resources, then they will always be become politicized. Ultimately, different factions will start fighting over them. There will be more and more powerful factions. And of course, the most powerful faction in the context is the state, or at least the state is the instrument through which powerful factions actually manage to impose their sense of power um, and to grab resources. Um, so I think in that sense, uh, that's one of the elements that we that I think is really interesting when we think about futurity, is that a lot of what we've been talking about is predicated on people's ideas of what will happen in the future. But of course, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. And you talk to the drug dealers. Um, I, I mean, in the in the paper, I talk about low level street dealers or kind of mid level dealers. But you talk about the big dealer in the barrio um, who effectively got uh, taken out by the state, put in prison, and just recently was released uh, explicitly in order to run the government's kind of uh, uh, the the government drug trade. So, you know. That was not something that he had conceived at all in his mind about a future, potential future outcome. Thank you. Um, I considered your study very interesting, Nicaragua. Um, and given that most of the gang members maybe are in our age, I'd say, was it a revolving topic that people ask you that they want to get out of the gang or did they ever talk to you about you helping them to get out? So one of the things about gang to Nicaragua is that actually it's a finite status. People don't stay in the gang. I mean, there's, there are gangs around the world where you do have difficulty getting out. Um, say the Maras in Salvador, Honduras or Guatemala, for example. But in Nicaragua, as in most of the world, it's actually a, it's a kind of temporary status. I mean, they are technically youth gangs and you can't stay young forever as much as we want to. Um, but so they didn't necessarily ask me help to get out of the gang, but I would certainly be asked advice about what to do, particularly um, drug dealing. Uh, drug dealers. One guy who in my writing I call Bismarck actually asked me for advice. What should he do? Um, but I say, I kept saying to him, you should get out of drug dealing because, you know, in the long term, it's not healthy for you. Um, he said, yes, but, you know, I want to earn money. I need to earn money. Uh, what should I do? What should I invest my profits in that will enable me to have a level of profitability or a level of income uh, which guarantees the standard of living I want? I mean, I unwittingly said to him, well, you know, there's only two things which have actually brought back a rate of return over the long term. One is blue chip stock options, IBM, Microsoft, that kind of stuff, which um, you don't have access to. The other one is property. So he actually invested his money in property uh, and became a kind of big man in the barrio where he, at one point, he owed 10% of the barrio. Um, I mean, he lost it for other reasons afterwards. But, um, but the other thing to say about... Uh, gang members, there's one thing which I can say with a lot of confidence is that assuming you don't die and assuming you don't go to prison, um, you are more likely to be better off having been a gang member than not having been a gang member in the long term. At least that's in the barrio. I'm not necessarily generalizing that beyond it, but it's a, uh, uh, and I don't think that's necessarily true in all contexts, but certainly in the context that I studied, that's, that I can say that that's confident. And that makes you really wonder a little bit what it is about that context which makes it that being a gang member actually becomes a benefit because obviously being a, a gang member has benefit but it can't be seen as a kind of policy solution if you have more questions yeah oh, i'm sorry no i, I haven't seen you sorry Thank, thank you. So this is maybe a question for, for Matthias and Kedron. Um, so you're, 
I guess it's just like what's specific about illegal markets? Because the title of your special issue is Futurity Beyond the State. But I suppose many states have obviously had a great drive to reduce the state anyway. So the idea, I suppose, in many sort of neoliberal places that you should have less state and markets should sort the future out for themselves. So so reflecting on all of this project, what's specific about them, the fact they're illegal? Or basically, could you just have had Futurity Beyond the State Markets and Futures? That's my question. Well, wow, thank you so much. I'll I'll take a first. Um, sure, it's a very good question. Um, uh, I think we started from the premise, of course, that um, there is something that matters about illegality in terms of a different kind of relationship to the state and the kinds of hopes and aspirations that the state encourages. Um, that uh, I think I said a little bit of this before, but. Um, you know, there's something, uh, as an anthropologist, I'm, I'm reluctant to uh, sort of acknowledge or to admit without really investigating it, that futuring even is something that's universal, <laughs> right? Um, that everyone sort of engages in the same kinds of projections, plans, um, uh, forms of hope uh, everywhere around the world and in all contexts. Um, it's really important for us to keep in mind that capitalism itself uh, demands of us that we plan and that we deal with uncertainty, right? That's the nature, that's part of the nature of capitalist markets. And the nature of states is that as certain kinds of political entities, they are there to make promises uh, as a means of acquiring support. And so in context, I think the idea, right, was that in context in which people have contested relationships to those organisms, to those institutions, that perhaps there, there would be something else happening, right? Some, some other forms of futuring or some other forms of planning or some other kinds of futures that people might imagine. I'm not sure that we found that there truly are. I think it's a, still a question, really, in my mind. Certainly, Across the articles, we find that people are interested in, I think, each of these contexts, and I don't know if it's because of illegality or not, right? Maybe each of our authors would have something to say about this as well. But we found that people are interested in certain forms of self-reliance and perhaps autonomy. That might be something that we find in a lot of work on Latin America, actually. Um, I don't know, I don't wanna overgeneralize. Um, we also find different forms of solidarity, though, and community in each of these contexts, maybe less among the middle class in Venezuela. But I think about Dennis's work in Managua and the auto construction context in Medellin, maybe the Cucaleros, too, that we find different forms of solidarity and community that are not necessarily recognized or promoted by the state or by capitalism. So I think there is something, I think there is something there about being outside of those formal structures and institutions. Although, of course, Dennis, it, you know, has been terrific throughout this whole process of reminding us at every moment that legality and illegality are always overlapping and that legitimacy is something that's always being contested, right? So people are not living illegal lives, right? I mean, that's an incredibly problematic thing to say or to suggest. But when people's primary income perhaps comes from economic activities that are criminalized or rendered illegal or that are um, otherwise not state sanctioned, perhaps it opens up some space. So I think I've taken up all the rest of our time. I, I just wanted to add that this, this, this project, this is also a reaction to, to the literature, to, to what we have. And, and we have seen in the last years, a wealth of, I mean, literature on on the future future futurity imaginaries of the future in i mean perfectly legal markets and we wanted to show that in, in this context and in illegal informal economies uh, there is something to 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 observe something to to see and we wanted to bring this these issues to discussion because I mean, in 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 this context, people also in these economies, people want to need credit, but the state is not there. 
they need to trust, but I mean, mechanisms of ensuring trust are not there. So the idea was more an empirical question. I mean, how in this context people imagine and secure these futures through other mechanisms. And we want, we had, a, 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 I remember our discussions, people are not imagining a different future. I mean, people in legal or illegal markets are imagining probably they want to have a house, they want to have a, I mean, gain, have money. The, the, the institutions that are enabling these this, this, this goals are probably different. <laughs> so but uh we are i think over time i i thank you all for uh, attending for coming uh, to participate in this discussion i wanted to thank the the author for this terrific pieces of research and i would like to to uh, again thank the the presenters okay thank you very much and to Catherine. So thank you very, very much, Catherine. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, thank you for your participation. Uh, as a token of appreciation, I would like to uh, give a small gift to our panelists and moderators for contributing uh, a lot to this event. Uh, I hope Liliana and Camilo were also here so that we could give them some uh, Swiss chocolates, but hopefully next time. Thank you very, very much. Thanks for sitting in a line so that's easier. <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you so much to everyone on Zoom. Thank and you very you much. For making sure that all of this is like. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. your participation.